midnight at the morgue. The wind howled through the empty streets as Sarah pulled her coat tighter around her. It was just past midnight, and the chill in the air cut through her like a knife. She regretted taking the night shift at the morgue, but, but the extra money was too tempting to pass up. As she approached the old, imposing building, she couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The morgue stood isolated at the edge of town, surrounded by thick woods that seemed to swallow up the light. Its tall stone walls were cracked and weathered, and the few windows that weren't boarded up were smeared with grime. The place had a reputation, stories of strange occurrences, whispers of restless spirits, but Sarah had never been one to believe in such things. She was practical, grounded, and always prided herself on her ability to stay calm under pressure. Inside, the morgue was as cold as a tomb, the silence heavy and oppressive. Sarah flicked on the lights, but the flickering fluorescent bulbs did little to dispel the darkness that seemed to cling to every corner. The faint hum of the cooling units was the only sound as she made her way to the front desk, where a single file lay waiting for her. The name on the file read Jane Doe. No age, no cause of death, just a note that the body had been found abandoned on the outskirts of town. Sarah's stomach churned slightly as she opened the drawer and pulled out the sheet covering the body. Jane Doe was a woman in her mid-twenties, her skin pale as marble, her eyes closed peacefully as if she were merely sleeping. Sarah shivered despite herself. There was something unsettling about the woman's appearance, something that made her feel like she was being watched. She shook off the feeling and began her work, noting down the usual details, height, weight, any distinguishing marks. But as she reached for her tools, she noticed something strange. Jane Doe's lips were slightly parted, and her teeth, though faintly visible, seemed sharper than they should have been. Sarah leaned in closer, peering at them under the harsh light. It was almost as if they had been filed to points, though she knew that was impossible. But then, she had seen stranger things in her time at the morgue. She dismissed the thought and continued her examination. As she worked, the wind outside picked up, rattling the windows and sending a low, mournful whistle through the halls. Sarah tried to focus, but her mind kept drifting back to the woman's teeth, to the eerie stillness of the body, to the stories she had heard about this place. It wasn't long before the power began to flicker, the lights dimming and then surging back to life in rapid succession. Sarah cursed under her breath, knowing that the building's electrical system was old and unreliable. But just as she was about to return to her work, the lights went out completely, plunging the morgue into darkness. For a moment, Sarah stood still, her heart pounding in her chest. She fumbled for her phone, using its flashlight to cut through the gloom. The beam of light was weak, barely illuminating the space around her, but it was better than nothing. She tried to calm herself, reminding herself that there was nothing to fear, that she was alone in the building. But as she moved the light across the room, her breath caught in her throat. The body on the table was no longer still. Jane Doe's chest was rising and falling in shallow, uneven breaths, her eyes fluttering open, revealing pupils that were entirely black. Sarah stumbled back, nearly dropping her phone in her panic. This couldn't be happening. The woman was dead. She had checked the vital signs herself. But as she watched in horror, Jane Doe slowly sat up, turning her head to look directly at Sarah. Help me, the woman whispered, her voice a raspy hiss that sent chills down Sarah's spine. Sarah's mind raced, torn between the instinct to run and the duty to help. She had no idea what was happening, no logical explanation for what she was seeing. But before she could decide what to do, the woman moved with unnatural speed, leaping off the table and lunging toward her. Sarah screamed, dropping her phone as she scrambled backward. The woman's hands were cold as ice as they gripped her arms, her face inches from Sarah's. She could smell the decay on her breath, feel the sharpness of those teeth brushing against her skin. Help me, Jane Doe repeated, but this time her voice was different, more urgent, more human. The blackness in her eyes seemed to fade slightly, revealing a flicker of something familiar, something pleading. Summoning every ounce of courage, Sarah broke free from the woman's grasp and grabbed a nearby scalpel. She pointed it at the woman, her hands shaking. Stay back, Sarah shouted, her voice trembling. I don't know what you are, but stay away from me. 
The woman paused, her eyes locked on the scalpel. For a moment, she seemed to hesitate, as if struggling against some unseen force. Then, with a final, desperate look, she collapsed to the floor, her body convulsing violently. Sarah watched in terror as the woman's skin began to crack, black veins spreading across her pale flesh like a spider's web. The convulsions grew more violent until, with a sickening crunch, the woman's body went still. But the silence was short-lived. From the cracked skin, something began to emerge, something dark and twisted, with long spindly limbs and glowing red eyes. It peeled itself away from the woman's corpse, its form shifting and writhing as it rose to its full height, towering over Sarah. She could barely comprehend what she was seeing, her mind reeling with fear and disbelief. The creature let out a low, guttural growl, its eyes fixed on her with a hunger that made her blood run cold. But before it could move, the lights flickered back on, flooding the room with harsh, artificial light. The creature hissed, recoiling as if burned by the light. It darted toward the shadows, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. Sarah stood there, trembling and gasping for breath, her mind struggling to process what had just happened. The room was silent once more the body on the floor now just an empty husk, brittle and crumbling to the touch. She didn't wait to find out what would happen next. Grabbing her phone, she bolted from the morgue, the wind outside whipping through her hair as she ran. She didn't stop until she was far from the building, her heart still racing, her mind filled with the image of those red glowing eyes. She never returned to the morgue after that night. But in the back of her mind, she knew that whatever she had seen, Whatever had escaped was still out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting for its next victim. And she couldn't shake the feeling that it was only a matter of time before it found her again. Story number two. Midnight cleanup. The clock struck midnight as Claire pulled into the desolate parking lot of the old Kingman Hotel. The place had seen better days. The paint was peeling off the walls and the neon sign that once proudly announced vacancy flickered ominously. The hotel had been closed for years, ever since the incident. Most of the locals avoided it, speaking in hushed tones about the tragedy that had occurred there. But Claire wasn't like most people. She needed the money, and the job offer had been too good to refuse. Just a simple cleanup job, the manager had said over the phone. One night, and you'll be paid handsomely. The hotel is being prepped for demolition, and we need someone to clean out the top floor. It's been locked up for years, so it shouldn't be too bad. Just a lot of dust, probably. Claire grabbed her cleaning supplies and flashlight from the trunk and headed toward the hotel's entrance. The heavy wooden door creaked as she pushed it open, revealing a dark, musty lobby. Her footsteps echoed in the empty space, the sound unnervingly loud in the silence. The elevator had long since stopped working, so she took the stairs to the top floor. With each step, the air grew colder, the shadows longer. A sense of unease settled over her, but she shook it off. It was just an old building, and her imagination was playing tricks on her. When she reached the top floor, she found the hallway lined with old, faded wallpaper and thick layers of dust. The doors to the rooms were shut tight, but one at the end of the hall was slightly ajar. That must be the room she needed to clean. Claire hesitated for a moment, then pushed the door open with a loud creak. Inside, the room was frozen in time. A thick layer of dust covered everything, the bed, the furniture, even the antique mirror on the wall. But what caught her eye was the large, ornate chandelier hanging from the ceiling, swaying slightly despite there being no breeze. As she set to work, the air around her seemed to grow heavier, almost oppressive. Claire tried to ignore the unsettling feeling creeping up her spine. She hummed to herself as she dusted and swept, the sound of her own voice strangely comforting. Then she heard it, a soft, almost imperceptible whisper. Claire froze, her heart pounding in her chest. She strained to listen, but the whisper had stopped. It must have been the wind, she told herself. Just the wind. But the windows were shut tight, and there wasn't the slightest draft in the room. She resumed her cleaning, her movements quicker now, more frantic. The sooner she finished, the sooner she could leave. But as she worked, the whispers returned, growing louder, more insistent. They seemed to be coming from the walls themselves, surrounding her, filling her mind with a chorus of unintelligible voices. Claire dropped her broom, 
her breathing ragged as she backed away from the walls. She needed to get out of there. Now. But as she turned to leave, the door slammed shut on its own, the sound reverberating through the room like a gunshot. Panic surged through her as she ran to the door, pulling on the handle with all her strength. It wouldn't budge. She was trapped. The whispers grew louder, almost deafening now. They were angry, accusing. Claire pressed her hands to her ears, trying to block them out, but it was no use. They were inside her head, clawing at her sanity. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she saw it. A shadow, darker than the rest of the room, standing in the corner. It was tall, impossibly tall, with long, spindly arms that seemed to stretch out towards her. The whispers intensified as the shadow began to move, slowly, deliberately, as if savoring her terror. Claire stumbled backward, her legs giving out as she collapsed to the floor. The shadow loomed over her, its presence suffocating. She tried to scream, but no sound came out. She could feel its cold breath on her skin, the air around her growing colder by the second. Then, just as she thought she couldn't take it anymore, the whispers stopped. The shadow receded, fading into the darkness, leaving Claire gasping for breath on the floor. The room was silent again, the only sound her own ragged breathing. Slowly, she got to her feet, her entire body trembling. The door was still shut, but when she tried the handle this time, it opened easily. She didn't waste a second, bolting out of the room and down the stairs, not stopping until she was outside, gulping in the cool night air. She leaned against her car, trying to steady her racing heart. It was over. She was safe. But as she fumbled for her keys, her hand brushed against something in her pocket. Puzzled, she pulled it out. A small, old-fashioned key, tarnished with age. She didn't remember picking it up. A chill ran down her spine as she realized the key was identical to the ones she had seen hanging in the hotel lobby, each labeled with a room number. But this one was different. There was no number on it, just a small, engraved symbol she didn't recognize. Suddenly, the car headlights flickered, and the engine roared to life on its own. Claire stumbled backward, dropping the key as the car's headlights illuminated the hotel. But the building wasn't empty anymore. Figures stood in the windows, dark silhouettes watching her. With trembling hands, Claire grabbed the key off the ground and bolted into the night, leaving the car and the hotel behind. But as she ran, she could still hear the whispers, faint but unmistakable, carried on the wind. They weren't finished with her yet, and deep down, she knew the key she now held was just the beginning. Story number three. Midnight call for help. Emily sat alone in her dimly lit living room, the only sound coming from the faint hum of the old ceiling fan. It was past midnight, and the house was eerily silent. The world outside was a black void, and the wind whispered against the windows like a forgotten ghost. She had always hated this hour, the time when the world felt the most empty, as if everyone else had vanished, leaving her utterly alone. She had been scrolling through her phone, trying to distract herself from the unsettling quiet, when the phone rang. The sudden sound made her jump, the harsh ringtone slicing through the stillness. She glanced at the screen, no caller ID. Her heart skipped a beat. Who would be calling at this hour? For a moment, she considered letting it ring out. But curiosity, or perhaps something deeper, something darker, compelled her to answer. She pressed the phone to her ear and hesitantly said, Hello? There was silence on the other end. Then, a voice, barely a whisper, crackled through the line. Help me. Emily's blood ran cold. The voice was faint, like someone was struggling to speak, gasping for breath. Who is this? She asked, her voice trembling. Where are you? The line crackled again, and the voice came back, slightly clearer, but still weak. I'm, I'm trapped. Help. Trapped where? Emily demanded, her anxiety growing. Tell me where you are so I can call someone. A shuffling noise echoed through the phone, followed by a low moan. The voice, now a bit stronger, whispered, I'm in your house. Emily froze, her heart pounding in her chest. She quickly scanned the room, her eyes darting to the shadows. It had to be a prank, she thought. Someone was trying to scare her. But the voice, it sounded so real, so desperate. She stood up, her legs trembling, and slowly walked to the hallway. The darkness seemed to stretch on forever, the familiar surroundings suddenly alien and menacing. She forced herself to speak, trying to keep her voice steady. This isn't funny. If you're trying to scare me, you're doing a good job. But this has to stop. 
please help me. The voice on the phone pleaded again, more insistent this time. I'm in the basement. Emily's breath caught in her throat. The basement. She hadn't been down there in months. It was a cluttered, dusty place full of forgotten things. A place she avoided because it reminded her of the past, of the things she had lost. The thought of someone being down there now, in the dead of night, filled her with dread. But what if it was true? What if someone was really down there, hurt and in need of help? The idea warred with the terror gnawing at her insides. She had to know. She had to see for herself. She grabbed a flashlight from the drawer in the kitchen and made her way to the basement door. Her hands shook as she turned the knob and the door creaked open with an agonizing slowness. The stale, cold air from below wafted up to greet her, carrying with it the scent of damp earth and decay. She shone the flashlight down the wooden stairs, the beam cutting through the darkness, but revealing nothing but the steps leading into the abyss. The basement was silent, still. She hesitated, every instinct screaming at her to close the door and walk away. But the voice, the desperate plea for help, echoed in her mind. Taking a deep breath, Emily descended the stairs, the wood creaking under her weight. The basement was colder than she remembered, the chill seeping into her bones. The flashlight flickered, casting shadows that danced and twisted on the walls. She reached the bottom and swept the light across the room. It was empty. The old furniture, covered in sheets, loomed like forgotten ghosts. Boxes of old memories were stacked in corners, gathering dust. Nothing seemed out of place, but the air was thick with an oppressive presence, as if something unseen was watching her. Hello? She called out, her voice barely above a whisper. Is anyone here? There was no response. The silence pressed in on her, suffocating. She turned slowly, shining the flashlight into every corner, but there was nothing, no one. Then she heard it, a faint, rhythmic thumping. It was coming from the far side of the basement, near the old wooden cabinet that had been in the house when she moved in. She hadn't dared to open it. Something about it had always felt wrong. The thumping grew louder, more insistent, as if something or someone was trapped inside, struggling to get out. Emily approached the cabinet, her heart pounding in her chest. She reached out, her hand trembling, and gripped the handle. The thumping stopped. For a moment, there was only silence. Then, the voice, the same voice from the phone, whispered from inside the cabinet, Help me. Fear paralyzed her, but she couldn't just walk away. With a burst of adrenaline, she yanked the cabinet door open, the old wood groaning in protest. The flashlight flickered, casting a weak beam inside. There was nothing but darkness, deep, impenetrable darkness. Emily leaned closer, trying to see what was inside, when suddenly, something cold and clammy grabbed her wrist. She screamed, jerking back, but the grip was strong, pulling her closer, dragging her into the cabinet. The flashlight fell from her hand, spinning on the floor and casting frantic beams of light around the room. Her screams echoed through the basement as she was pulled into the dark void within the cabinet, the door slamming shut behind her. The basement was silent once more. Upstairs, the phone rang again. The harsh ringtone echoed through the empty house, unanswered. Story number four. The abandoned construction site. The rain had started to fall in heavy sheets, turning the ground into a thick, clinging mud that made each step a struggle. Mark cursed under his breath, regretting his decision to take a shortcut through the old construction site. He had been working late at the office, and the usual route home was blocked by a fallen tree. The site was supposed to be a quick way around, but now he was beginning to second-guess himself. The place had been abandoned for years, a half-finished skeleton of concrete and steel that loomed ominously against the darkened sky. Mark had heard the rumors about it, of course. Everyone in town had. The project had been halted suddenly, the developers pulling out without warning, leaving the structure to decay. Some said it was because of money troubles. Others whispered of more sinister reasons. Stories of workers who had gone missing, strange accidents that had no logical explanation. But Mark wasn't the superstitious type. He was more concerned with getting home and out of the rain. As he trudged through the muck, the wind howled through the exposed beams and open floors above, creating an eerie, mournful wail that sent shivers down his spine. He pulled his jacket tighter around him, the cold seeping into his bones. 
The light from his phone's flashlight barely cut through the dense fog that had settled over the site, distorting the shadows and making the half-constructed walls appear to shift and move. Mark paused, wiping rain from his face. He felt the growing unease gnawing at the edges of his mind, a prickling sensation that made the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. He couldn't shake the feeling that he wasn't alone. He shook his head, dismissing the thought. Just get through, he told himself. The site wasn't that big, and he'd be back on the road in no time. But as he moved forward, something caught his eye. A flicker of movement out of the corner of his vision. He swung the light in that direction, but there was nothing there. Just piles of rusted rebar and stacks of crumbling bricks. Mark quickened his pace, his heartbeat matching the rhythm of the falling rain. The sight seemed to go on forever, each turn leading him deeper into the maze of abandoned materials and unfinished structures. The fog grew thicker, suffocating, and the darkness pressed in on him from all sides. A sound echoed through the empty space, a faint metallic clinking, like the sound of chains being dragged across concrete. Mark froze, straining to listen. The noise came again, closer this time. His pulse quickened, and he spun around, his light bouncing wildly as he searched for the source. Hello? He called out, his voice sounding small and lost in the vastness of the sight. The only response was the wind and the relentless drumming of rain on metal and stone. He continued on, more urgently now, his steps hurried and uneven. The sound of chains grew louder, more insistent, until it seemed to be right behind him. Mark whipped around, the light from his phone cutting through the fog, and there it was. A figure stood in the distance, barely visible through the haze. It was tall and thin, its limbs elongated and unnatural. The chains clattered around its feet as it moved slowly, deliberately, toward him. Mark's breath caught in his throat and he stumbled backward, his eyes locked on the approaching figure. It was wearing a construction worker's uniform, but the clothes were tattered and caked with mud. The helmet it wore was cracked, hanging loosely to one side, and beneath it, where a face should have been, there was only darkness a yawning void that seemed to absorb the light. Mark turned and ran, his feet slipping in the mud as he fled. He could hear the chains clattering behind him, faster now, gaining on him with every step. He didn't dare look back, he just ran, desperate to escape whatever horror was pursuing him. He rounded a corner, his breath coming in ragged gasps and slammed into a wall. Panic surged through him, he was trapped. The only way out was back the way he'd come, but he knew he couldn't go back. The chains were right behind him, the sound filling his ears, deafening in its proximity. Desperate, he spotted an open doorway leading into one of the half-built structures. He darted inside, slamming the door shut behind him. The room was dark, the windows boarded up, and the air was thick with the stench of mildew and decay. He pressed his back against the door, trying to quiet his breathing, that listening for the sound of the chains. But there was nothing, only silence. He waited, every muscle in his body tense, ready to bolt at the first sign of danger. But the silence stretched on, unbroken. Slowly, cautiously, Mark moved away from the door, his phone's flashlight sweeping the room. The space was empty, save for some discarded tools and a few broken chairs. Relief washed over him, and he let out a shaky breath. Maybe whatever it was had given up. Maybe it hadn't seen him come in here. But just as he began to let his guard down, something caught his eye an object in the corner of the room, half buried in debris. He approached it slowly, the beam of light revealing a worn leather notebook. It looked old, the pages yellowed and brittle. Mark picked it up, flipping it open to the first page. The writing was barely legible, scrawled in a hurried hand, but he could make out a few words. They're watching, they know, <laughs> can't leave. A chill ran down his spine. He flipped through more pages, each one filled with desperate, paranoid ramblings. Then he saw it, a drawing, hastily sketched but unmistakable. The figure he had seen outside, the one with the chains. It was there, staring out from the page with hollow, empty eyes. And then from behind him came a soft, rasping breath. Mark turned slowly, his heart pounding in his chest. The door was open, and standing in the doorway was the figure, that closer now, the chains dragging across the floor as it moved toward him. Mark dropped the notebook and backed away, his mind racing for a way out. But there was nowhere to go. No escape from this nightmare. 
the figure reached out, its long, skeletal fingers brushing against his arm. In that moment, Mark realized the truth. The stories, the rumors, they were all real. The workers hadn't just disappeared. They were still here, trapped in this place, bound by the chains of unfinished business, forever doomed to wander the site. And now, so was he. The last thing Mark saw before the darkness consumed him was the figure's void-like face, inches from his own, as the chains tightened around him, pulling him into the shadows. Story number five. In the quiet town of Maplewood, nestled far from the busy cities, there stood an old Victorian house that had long been forgotten. Its windows were shattered, the paint peeled, and the garden overgrown with weeds. Yet, despite its dilapidated state, the house had an air of mystery about it the kind that made people hurry past without looking too closely. Emma and John, a young couple fresh out of college, were drawn to the house as if by some invisible force. They had been looking for a place to call home, something cheap, something they could fix up themselves. When they stumbled upon the old house listed for a mere fraction of the going rate in the area, they couldn't believe their luck. John, ever the pragmatist, brushed off the warnings from locals about the house's history dismissing them as nothing more than silly superstitions. Emma, though a bit hesitant, agreed, seeing the house as a blank canvas for their future. It wasn't long after they moved in that strange things started happening. The first incident occurred late at night. Emma awoke to the sound of faint whispering. She sat up in bed, straining to hear, but the noise stopped abruptly, leaving her wondering if she had imagined it. She dismissed it, thinking it was just the wind or the creaking of the old house. However, the next morning, she noticed something odd. The freezer door was slightly ajar, a thin trail of blood leading from it to the floor. Startled, she quickly closed the door and cleaned up the mess, chalking it up to a piece of meat that had thawed and leaked. She mentioned it to John, who shrugged it off with a smile, telling her not to worry. But as the days passed, the whispering grew louder, more distinct, and the strange occurrences multiplied. Lights flickered, cold drafts swept through rooms with no apparent source, and every night, without fail, Emma would find the freezer door open with that same trail of blood leading out. No matter how carefully she shut it, the freezer would always be open the next morning. John remained skeptical, insisting that there was a logical explanation. Perhaps the old wiring was faulty, or maybe the house had a rodent problem. He even suggested that Emma might be sleepwalking, unknowingly opening the freezer in her sleep. However, Emma couldn't shake the feeling that something far more sinister was at play. One evening, as a storm raged outside, Emma decided she had had enough. She would get to the bottom of the mystery. Armed with a flashlight and a heavy kitchen knife for good measure, she crept down to the kitchen. The house was eerily quiet, save for the occasional rumble of thunder. As she approached the freezer, she noticed that the trail of blood was already there, fresh and glistening on the floor. Her heart pounded in her chest as she slowly opened the freezer door. Inside, she found nothing but a few bags of frozen vegetables and a couple of old ice trays. But as she was about to close the door, something caught her eye. Beneath the ice trays was a small, old-fashioned lockbox, partially obscured by frost. Emma's hands shook as she pulled it out and examined it. The box was cold to the touch, and there was no keyhole, only a simple latch keeping it shut. She hesitated for a moment before deciding to open it. The lid creaked as she lifted it, revealing a stack of old photographs and a small leather-bound journal. The photos were black and white, depicting a family, a mother, father, and two children, smiling in front of the house. As she flipped through them, the images became more disturbing. The smiles disappeared, replaced by expressions of fear and anguish. The last photo showed the family huddled together in the corner of the kitchen, their eyes wide with terror. And in the background, the freezer door was open, a dark figure barely visible inside. Emma's breath caught in her throat as she turned to the journal. The pages were filled with frantic scrawls, detailing the family's descent into madness. The mother, who had been the primary writer, described how they had moved into the house with high hopes, only for strange occurrences to begin almost immediately. The freezer, she wrote, was at the center of it all. Every night, the blood would appear, and with it, the whispers, growing louder and more insistent. 
The family had tried everything, exorcisms, priests, even sealing the freezer shut with chains, but nothing worked. The last entry was hastily written, the handwriting shaky and barely legible. It spoke of a malevolent presence, something ancient and evil that lived within the freezer. The mother wrote of her desperation, her fear that they would never escape. She ended with a chilling note. Whatever you do, don't open the freezer. It feeds on blood. A cold dread washed over Emma as she realized the implications. She had been feeding the entity all along, unintentionally keeping it alive. Her hands trembled as she closed the journal, her mind racing. What had she unleashed? At that moment, the lights flickered and a low, guttural growl filled the room. Emma froze, her eyes darting to the freezer. The door was slowly opening on its own, revealing nothing but darkness inside. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, forming words she couldn't quite understand. Panic surged through her as she realized that she needed to leave, now. But as she turned to run, she was stopped in her tracks. John stood in the doorway, his eyes wide with a strange, vacant look. He was holding the kitchen knife she had left on the counter, his knuckles white as he gripped the handle. John? Emma's voice was barely a whisper. His head tilted slightly, a cruel smile forming on his lips. It's hungry, he said, his voice eerily calm. And you're the perfect offering. Before Emma could react, John lunged at her, the knife gleaming in the dim light. She stumbled back, her mind racing to make sense of the horror unfolding before her. She had to get out to escape this nightmare. But as she scrambled to her feet, her gaze fell on the freezer. The darkness inside was no longer empty. Something was moving, slithering out into the kitchen. Emma's scream was cut short as the thing in the freezer took hold, dragging her into the cold, dark abyss. The last thing she saw was John's vacant smile, the knife falling from his hand as the whispers turned into laughter, echoing through the empty house. The next morning, the old Victorian house stood as it always had, silent and foreboding. The kitchen was pristine, save for the freezer door, which was slightly ajar, a thin trail of blood leading from it to the floor. Story number six. Death by the time clock. The small town of Ravenswood had always been cloaked in shadows. A dense, eerie fog often crept through its streets, swallowing the sound of footsteps and whispers. But nothing was as ominous as the old clock tower that loomed over the town square. For years, the clock tower had been silent, its hands frozen at midnight. No one knew why it had stopped ticking. Some said it was cursed, others claimed it was simply broken, but no one dared to approach it, until the night the stranger arrived. It was a stormy evening when Jonathan Graves first set foot in Ravenswood. He was a watchmaker by trade, drawn to the town by the rumors of the broken clock. He had a fascination with timepieces, especially those with a mysterious history. The moment he heard of the clock tower, he knew he had to fix it. Jonathan rented a small room at the edge of town, where the landlady, Mrs. Haversham, warned him against meddling with the clock tower. Leave it be, she advised with a trembling voice. That clock stopped for a reason. But Jonathan dismissed her warnings. He was a man of logic, not superstition. The next morning, he set out to the clock tower, tools in hand. The tower was even more imposing up close, its stone walls slick with age and dampness. The door creaked open with a push, revealing a spiraling staircase that led into darkness. Jonathan took a deep breath and began his ascent. Each step echoed ominously in the silence. As he climbed higher, the air grew colder, the shadows thicker. Finally, he reached the clock's chamber. The massive gears and cogs were covered in dust, as if untouched for decades. Yet the mechanism seemed intact, albeit in dire need of maintenance. Jonathan set to work immediately, cleaning, oiling, and adjusting the clock's intricate innards. Hours passed as he lost himself in the work, the sound of ticking slowly returning to the chamber. He felt a sense of triumph as he wound the clock and watched the hands move for the first time in years. But as the clock's hand approached midnight, something strange began to happen. The air in the chamber grew heavy, oppressive. The ticking grew louder, more insistent, almost as if it were pounding inside his skull. A sudden chill ran down Jonathan's spine as he heard footsteps echoing from the stairwell. He turned, but there was no one there. Dismissing it as his imagination, he continued working, but the sense of unease only grew stronger. Then the clock struck midnight. The chime echoed through the chamber, 
deep and resonant, but it wasn't just a sound. It was a wave of energy that pulsed through the room, rattling the very walls. Jonathan staggered back, eyes wide with disbelief, as the gears began to move on their own, faster and faster, until they were a blur of metal. The hands of the clock spun wildly, past midnight, past dawn, past dusk, faster and faster, until they were nothing but a blur. The room seemed to warp around him, the walls bending, the floor shifting beneath his feet. And then, abruptly, the clock stopped. The hands froze again, this time at a peculiar time, three minutes past midnight. The chamber was deathly silent, save for Jonathan's ragged breathing. He glanced around, panic rising in his chest. Something was wrong, very wrong. He turned to leave, but stopped dead in his tracks. Standing at the top of the staircase was a figure, shrouded in shadow. It was tall and thin, with eyes that glowed a sickly green in the darkness. Jonathan's heart pounded in his chest as the figure stepped closer, its features becoming clearer. It was a man, or at least it had once been. Its skin was pale and stretched tightly over its bones, its mouth twisted into a grotesque smile. It wore an old-fashioned suit, the kind worn by watchmakers in the 18th century. Jonathan realized with horror that the figure's hands were shackled, the chains trailing off into the darkness. He tried to move, but his body was frozen in place. You've wound the clock, the figure whispered, its voice like the rustling of dead leaves. Now you must pay the price. Jonathan's mind raced, trying to make sense of the situation. What are you? He managed to stammer. The figure's smile widened, revealing sharp, yellowed teeth. I was once the keeper of this clock, it said. But I tampered with time, and now I am its prisoner. Every century, the clock demands a new keeper, one who will wind it and take my place. Jonathan's blood ran cold as the figure stepped closer, the chains clinking softly with each movement. No, he whispered, backing away. This isn't real. It's just a dream. The figure's laughter echoed through the chamber, harsh and grating. Oh, it's very real, it hissed. You've wound the clock, and now you are bound to it forever. Jonathan felt a cold hand close around his wrist, and suddenly the world around him began to spin. The clock's gears started turning again, faster and faster, pulling him into their depths. He screamed, but the sound was swallowed by the ticking, the relentless ticking that grew louder and louder until it consumed him. And then there was silence. The next morning, the townspeople gathered around the clock tower, marveling at the sound of the clock ticking once again. The hands moved steadily, marking the passage of time. But Jonathan Graves was never seen again. In the small room at the edge of town, Mrs. Habersham sighed as she dusted off the table. She had warned him, but like all the others before him, he hadn't listened. As she glanced out the window at the clock tower, she noticed something odd. The hands of the clock were stuck at three minutes past midnight. She frowned, a sense of dread washing over her. The clock had claimed another victim. And somewhere, deep within the bowels of the tower, Jonathan Graves stood motionless, his eyes glowing a sickly green, his mouth twisted into a grotesque smile. He was the new keeper of the clock, and time, for him, would never move forward again. Story number seven. The elevator's final stop. Samantha had been working late again. The long hours at the law firm were starting to wear on her, but she needed this job. The fluorescent lights in her office flickered, casting shadows that danced across the walls. She glanced at her watch, 11.48 p.m. The building was empty, as it always was at this hour. Her heels clicked against the polished floor as she made her way to the elevator, the sound echoing in the silent corridor. The elevator doors opened with a soft ding, revealing an empty cabin. She stepped inside, pressing the button for the ground floor. As the doors slid shut, a slight shiver ran down her spine. The air inside the elevator was stale, almost suffocating. Samantha brushed off the feeling as nothing more than exhaustion. The elevator hummed to life, beginning its descent. The ride was smooth at first, the soft hum of machinery almost lulling her into a daze. But then, the elevator jerked suddenly, and the lights flickered. Samantha's heart skipped a beat as the cabin came to a grinding halt. She was trapped between floors. She frantically pressed the buttons, hoping to restart the elevator, but nothing happened. The emergency button yielded no response, not even a crackle of static. Panic began to set in as she realized her phone was out of battery. She was completely alone. 
Suddenly, the elevator lights went out, plunging her into darkness. Her breath caught in her throat as she stood frozen in the pitch black. The only sound was her own breathing, rapid and shallow. Then, a soft noise broke the silence, a faint scraping sound coming from above. Samantha's eyes darted upward, though she could see nothing in the darkness. The scraping grew louder, more distinct, like nails dragging across metal. She backed into the corner of the elevator, her heart pounding in her chest. The noise stopped, leaving her in an eerie silence. Just as she was about to let out a shaky breath, the elevator lights flickered back on. But the cabin was different now. The walls were no longer the dull, reflective steel she remembered. They were covered in deep scratches, as if something had clawed at them in a frenzy. Her stomach twisted in fear, and she struggled to breathe. She needed to get out, now. She tried the emergency hatch on the ceiling, but it wouldn't budge. She was trapped. The elevator jolted again, this time descending slowly, far slower than it should have been. The floor numbers above the door began to count down, each ding reverberating ominously in the enclosed space. Ten, nine, eight, the lights flickered with each number, the cabin trembling as if the whole building were on the verge of collapse. Seven, six, five. Samantha's mind raced. She had to stay calm, had to find a way out, but the growing sense of dread was suffocating her. The scratching sound returned, louder now, coming from all around her. Four, three. Tears welled up in her eyes as the air grew colder. The walls seemed to close in. The once spacious elevator now felt like a coffin. She pressed her back against the wall, her fingers clawing at the buttons, but they were useless. Two, the elevator slowed to a crawl, the lights flickering so rapidly that it felt like she was caught in a strobe. The scratching intensified, the sound now a cacophony of nails on metal, echoing in her ears. One, the elevator came to a stop, the doors opening slowly with a creak. But instead of the familiar lobby, she was greeted by a long, dark corridor its walls lined with peeling wallpaper and dim, flickering lights. The air was thick with the stench of decay. Samantha hesitated, her instincts screaming at her to stay inside the elevator, but something compelled her to step out. The moment she did, the elevator doors slammed shut behind her, the sound reverberating through the corridor. She was trapped. The corridor stretched on endlessly, the darkness at the far end seeming to swallow everything in its path. There were no signs of life, no windows, just a suffocating sense of dread. The lights above her flickered ominously as she took a tentative step forward. As she walked, the scratching sound returned, this time accompanied by a faint whispering. It was unintelligible, a soft chorus of voices that sent chills down her spine. She quickened her pace, desperate to find an exit, but the corridor seemed to stretch on forever. Then she saw it, a door at the very end of the corridor, slightly ajar with a dim light spilling out. Hope surged through her, and she broke into a run, the whispers growing louder with each step. She reached the door and hesitated for only a second before pushing it open. Inside was a small, dimly lit room. In the center stood an old elevator, identical to the one she had just left, its doors open and waiting. But something was wrong. The air was heavy with the scent of iron, and the walls were covered in dark stains. The whispering grew louder, more frantic, filling the room with a sense of impending doom. Samantha's heart raced as she approached the elevator, unable to resist the pull. She stepped inside, and the doors closed behind her with a soft click. The elevator jolted to life, descending once more. This time, there was no display to indicate the floors. The lights dimmed, the air growing colder with each passing second. Samantha hugged herself, her breath coming in short gasps. The whispers grew louder, filling the cabin with their maddening chant. Suddenly, the elevator came to a halt. The doors slid open to reveal a vast, empty space, shrouded in darkness. Samantha stepped out, her feet touching cold, hard ground. She was outside, but not in the world she knew. The sky was a sickly shade of green, the landscape barren and desolate. The whispers had stopped, replaced by an eerie silence. She turned back to the elevator, but it was gone, vanished into thin air. Samantha was alone in this strange, lifeless world, with no way back. As she stood there, her mind reeling, she realized the truth. The elevator wasn't just a malfunctioning machine. It was a gateway, a portal to a place that should not exist, a place where the lost were doomed to wander forever. And she had just taken the final ride. Story number eight. 
the hotel was old, with creaky wooden floors that groaned under the weight of forgotten memories. It had been built decades ago, its once grand architecture now hidden beneath layers of dust and neglect. Located far from the city, it attracted few visitors, most of whom were just passing through on their way to somewhere else. The manager, Mr. Hargrove, was a gaunt man in his 60s, with deep-set eyes that seemed to hold secrets no one dared to uncover. On a cold October evening, Jenna pulled up in front of the hotel. Her car had broken down several miles back, and she had walked the rest of the way, her breath fogging up in the chilly air. She was a young woman in her late 20s, traveling alone for a much-needed break from the grind of city life. The sight of the hotel, though eerie, was a relief. The lobby was dimly lit, with a single bulb flickering ominously above the reception desk. Mr. Hargrove was there, silently watching as Jenna approached. Good evening, Jenna greeted, her voice echoing in the emptiness. Evening, Mr. Hargrove replied in a low, gravelly voice. Need a room? Yes, please, just for the night. He handed her an old-fashioned key, the brass number 13 dangling from it. Third floor, end of the hall. Jenna hesitated. Is there another room available? Mr. Hargrove's expression didn't change. That's the only one left. With no other choice, Jenna took the key and thanked him. The elevator was out of order, so she climbed the grand staircase, the carpet worn thin from years of use. The hallway on the third floor was long and narrow, lined with doors that seemed to loom over her. The air was stale, and the only sound was the soft whisper of her footsteps. When she reached her room, she inserted the key into the lock and turned it with some effort. The door creaked open, revealing a small, dusty room with a single bed, a wooden dresser, and a window that overlooked the dark forest surrounding the hotel. The wallpaper was peeling in places, and the air inside was musty, as if the room hadn't been occupied in years. Jenna dropped her bag on the bed and sat down, feeling a shiver run through her. There was something off about the room something she couldn't quite put her finger on. She tried to shake off the feeling, telling herself it was just her imagination. She was tired after all, and the strangeness of the hotel was getting to her. She unpacked a few things and then headed to the bathroom. The light flickered on, revealing a small, dingy space with a cracked mirror. As she washed her face, she heard a faint noise behind her. She froze, her heart pounding. Slowly, she turned to look, but the bathroom was empty. She let out a breath, laughing nervously at herself. It was just the old plumbing, she thought. As the night wore on, Jenna tried to sleep, but the uneasy feeling wouldn't leave her. The bed was uncomfortable, the mattress lumpy and the blankets thin. She tossed and turned, her mind racing. She couldn't shake the sense that she wasn't alone in the room. At some point, she finally drifted off, but her sleep was fitful, filled with strange, disjointed dreams. She dreamt of the hallway outside her room, but it was longer, endless, stretching into darkness. The doors were all slightly ajar, and from each one, something unseen watched her. She woke with a start, her heart racing, only to find herself in the same room, the same oppressive silence pressing down on her. But something was different. The air in the room felt heavier, thicker. And then she heard it, a soft rustling sound, like someone moving slowly across the floor. Jenna's breath caught in her throat. She strained to listen, her eyes wide in the darkness. The sound was coming from the corner of the room, near the dresser. Summoning her courage, Jenna reached for the bedside lamp and flicked it on. The weak light barely illuminated the room, casting long shadows that danced on the walls. She looked toward the dresser, and her blood ran cold. There, on the floor, was a crumpled piece of paper, one she was sure hadn't been there before. She hesitated before leaning over to pick it up. Her hands shook as she unfolded it. The paper was old, yellowed with age, and the writing on it was faint, as if it had been scrawled in a hurry. The words were chilling. Don't trust him. Get out while you still can. Jenna's mind raced. Who had left this note? And what did it mean? Her thoughts immediately went to Mr. Hargrove. There was something off about him, something she hadn't been able to place before. She stood, her legs unsteady, and decided to leave the room. She needed to get out of the hotel, away from whatever was happening. She grabbed her bag and headed for the door, but as she reached for the handle, she froze. The door was already open, just a crack. She hadn't heard anyone come in. Her pulse quickened as she slowly pushed it open, peering into the hallway. 
it was empty, the same eerie silence filling the space. But then she heard it, a faint, almost imperceptible whisper. It was coming from down the hall, near the stairs. Jenna stepped out, her instinct screaming at her to run. Top, but something held her back. She crept toward the stairs, the whisper growing louder, more distinct. It was a voice, low and urgent, but she couldn't make out the words. As she reached the top of the stairs, the voice stopped abruptly. The silence that followed was deafening. Jenna looked down the staircase, her breath catching in her throat. There, standing at the bottom was Mr. Hargrove. He was looking up at her, his expression unrateable, his eyes dark and hollow. I see you found the note, he said, his voice calm, almost amused. Jenna's blood ran cold. What do you want? she demanded, her voice trembling. Mr. Hargrove smiled, a slow, sinister smile that didn't reach his eyes. This place, it has a way of keeping people. You're not the first to stay in that room, and you won't be the last. Jenna took a step back, her heart pounding in her chest. What are you talking about? People check in, but they don't check out. Not really. His smile widened. You see, the hotel likes company. Panic surged through Jenna as she turned and bolted back down the hallway. She could hear Mr. Hargrove's footsteps behind her, slow and deliberate, but she didn't dare look back. She reached her room and slammed the door shut, locking it with trembling hands. She backed away, her breath coming in short gasps, and then she heard it, the rustling sound again, coming from the dresser. She turned slowly, her eyes widening in terror as she saw the drawer slide open on its own. Inside was another note, identical to the first too late. The lights flickered and went out, plunging the room into darkness. Jenna felt a presence behind her, cold breath on the back of her neck. She turned, but there was nothing there, just the oppressive darkness closing in around her. The last thing she heard before everything went black was Mr. Hargrove's voice, a whisper in her ear. Welcome home. Story number nine. The final passage. Maya boarded the 11.45 PM train from the city center her heart still pounding from the hurried pace of the evening. She had been running late, and the last train was her only option to get back home to the sleepy village where she lived alone. The platform was unusually deserted for a Friday night, with only a handful of passengers scattered in the shadows, their faces obscured by the dim lighting. As she settled into her seat, Maya noticed something strange. The train cars were far older than she remembered. The seats were worn, the walls scuffed, and the lights flickered with a dull, sickly glow. She tried to shake off the uneasy feeling that gnawed at her, but, but the atmosphere was thick with an unsettling quiet. The train jerked forward, the engine's hum vibrating through her bones. Maya glanced around, realizing that the other passengers seemed oddly distant, almost like they weren't really there. She strained to see their faces, but every time she tried, her eyes slid away as if the shadows themselves were repelling her gaze. Determined to distract herself, Maya pulled out her phone to check the time, only to find that it had died. She cursed under her breath, stuffing it back into her bag. With nothing to occupy her mind, she began to take in her surroundings more carefully. The train seemed to move faster than usual, the landscape outside a blur of dark shapes and fleeting lights. She felt a chill creep over her, as if the temperature had dropped several degrees. After what felt like an eternity, the train came to a sudden stop. The jolt snapped Maya out of her thoughts, and she looked around in confusion. There was no announcement, no indication of where they were. She peered out of the window, expecting to see the familiar countryside station near her village, but instead, there was nothing but darkness. A deep, impenetrable void stretched out beyond the glass, swallowing the feeble light of the train. Panic surged through Maya as she realized the other passengers were no longer in their seats. The train was empty. The silence was absolute. Her breath quickened as she stood up, clutching her bag tightly. The train doors remained closed, trapping her inside. She moved down the aisle, calling out, but her voice echoed back to her, hollow and alone. Desperation clawed at her chest as she pounded on the doors, trying to force them open, but they wouldn't budge. Suddenly, a low, rumbling sound filled the car, like distant thunder. The lights flickered violently, casting eerie shadows that seemed to dance along the walls. Maya turned, heart racing, as she felt the ground beneath her tremble. The train lurched forward again, but this time it wasn't on any track she recognized. 
The rumbling grew louder, and the train began to pick up speed. The void outside remained, but the sense of movement was undeniable. Maya stumbled as the train careened forward, the old car rattling with the force. The sound became deafening, a cacophony of grinding metal and roaring wind. As the train sped on, Maya saw something emerging from the darkness outside the windows. It was as if the void itself was taking shape, forming grotesque, shifting figures that loomed over the train, their eyes burning with a malevolent glow. They pressed against the windows, their forms amorphous and nightmarish, mouths opening in silent screams. Maya backed away, terror coursing through her veins. The figures outside clawed at the glass, their long, twisted limbs stretching unnaturally. She felt the air grow thick, suffocating, as if the darkness was seeping into the train. Her mind raced, searching for a way out, but there was none. Just as she felt she couldn't take another breath, the train screeched to a halt. The force of the stop threw her to the floor, and for a moment, everything went still. The rumbling ceased, and the only sound was her own ragged breathing. Maya struggled to her feet, her entire body trembling. The train doors finally slid open with a hiss, revealing a station platform that she didn't recognize. It was bathed in a dim, sickly light, the air thick with a strange, metallic smell. She hesitated, staring out at the desolate platform, unsure if she should step out or stay inside the relative safety of the train. But something compelled her to move forward. Her legs felt heavy, as if each step was dragging her deeper into the unknown. She stepped out onto the platform, her senses on high alert. The air was cold and still, and the station appeared abandoned, its old, crumbling walls covered in thick layers of grime. Maya turned back to the train, but as she did, the doors closed with a final, echoing clang. She watched in horror as the train began to move again, slowly at first, then picking up speed until it vanished into the darkness, leaving her alone in the eerie station. A voice crackled over the ancient PA system, distorted and barely audible. End of the line, it said, the words hanging in the air like a death knell. Maya's heart pounded in her chest as she looked around, desperate for any sign of life, any indication of where she was. But the station was devoid of all human presence, a tomb of forgotten memories. She realized with growing dread that there were no exits, no signs, nothing to indicate a way out. And then she saw it, a mirror at the far end of the platform, it was old, its surface covered in dust and grime, but something about it drew her in. As she approached, she saw her reflection, pale and ghostly, staring back at her. But there was something wrong. Her reflection's eyes were dark, hollow, filled with the same void she had seen outside the train. Her reflection smiled. Maya stumbled back, her mind reeling. The mirror began to ripple, the surface distorting until it was no longer a reflection, but a portal opening into the same darkness that had consumed the train. She felt an icy wind pull at her, dragging her closer to the mirror's surface. No, she screamed, trying to fight against the force, but it was too strong. The last thing she saw was her own terrified face, twisted in horror, as she was pulled into the abyss. The station returned to its oppressive silence. The mirror stood unchanged, reflecting nothing but the empty platform, waiting for the next lost soul to arrive. Story number 10. The Night Watcher's Curse. The air was thick with the scent of pine and decaying leaves as Rachel drove along the winding road, her headlights cutting through the oppressive darkness. She had been invited to spend the weekend at an old cabin nestled deep in the woods by her friend Sarah. Though the idea of a secluded getaway sounded relaxing, the eerie stories about the forest's history had always unnerved her. The locals whispered of disappearances and strange occurrences, but Rachel brushed off the tales as nothing more than folklore designed to keep city dwellers away. As she pulled up to the cabin, the night's silence engulfed her. The towering trees seemed to close in, their branches gnarled like the hands of something waiting in the shadows. The cabin stood isolated, its wooden frame appearing frail under the silver light of the full moon. Sarah's car was parked outside, but the windows were dark. Rachel assumed she had gone inside and was probably asleep. Rachel grabbed her bags, the gravel crunching underfoot as she walked towards the door. The night was still, unnervingly so. She pushed open the door, the old wood creaking loudly in protest. Inside, the cabin was cold, the air stale. The fireplace lay dormant, and there was no sign of Sarah. 
Sarah? Rachel called out, her voice echoing through the empty rooms. There was no reply. She wandered through the cabin, her unease growing with each step. The furniture was covered in dust, and there were no signs of recent habitation. No food, no belongings, nothing to indicate that anyone had been here. Her phone buzzed, and Rachel looked down to see a message from Sarah. Running late. We'll be there by midnight. Make yourself comfortable. Rachel's brow furrowed. How could Sarah's car be outside if she wasn't here? She dismissed it as a simple mix-up. Perhaps Sarah had just borrowed someone else's car. But the creeping dread in her stomach told her otherwise. With no other options, Rachel settled into the old leather armchair near the fireplace, trying to relax. But the silence of the cabin was oppressive, each creak and groan of the wooden structure setting her nerves on edge. She decided to pass the time by reading, pulling out a book from her bag. But as the minutes ticked by, her focus drifted. The sense of being watched gnawed at her. The wind howled outside, rattling the windows. The fire she had managed to start flickered, casting long, dancing shadows across the walls. Her phone screen illuminated again. Another message from Sarah. I'm close. Don't wait up. But this time, something felt wrong. The message was garbled, the letters distorted as if something had tampered with it. Rachel stood up, peering out the window into the inky blackness. The forest seemed alive, the trees swaying unnaturally, and she could swear she saw movement, dark figures darting between the trunks. She backed away from the window, her heart pounding in her chest. Suddenly, the lights flickered, and the cabin was plunged into darkness. The only light now came from the fire, its flames dimming as if being smothered by an unseen force. Rachel fumbled with her phone, trying to use its flashlight, but it refused to turn on. Panic set in, and she felt an overwhelming urge to leave, but something kept her rooted in place. A presence, something old and malevolent. A soft knock echoed through the cabin. It was subtle, almost as if someone was gently tapping their fingers against the door. Rachel froze, her breath hitching in her throat. The knock came again, a little louder this time, persistent. She hesitated, fear clawing at her insides, but she couldn't ignore it. Who's there? She called out, her voice trembling. No answer, just another knock. Rachel grabbed the fire poker, her only means of defense, and approached the door. As she reached for the handle, the knocking stopped. She waited, the silence deafening, and then slowly opened the door. No one was there. The night air rushed in, cold and biting. The forest lay still, but the feeling of being watched intensified. Rachel stepped out onto the porch, her eyes scanning the darkness. That's when she saw it, a figure standing at the edge of the trees. It was tall, its features obscured by the shadows, but she could feel its gaze burning into her. The figure didn't move, didn't make a sound, just stood there watching. Rachel backed away, her pulse racing, and slammed the door shut. She locked it, but the sense of security it provided was fleeting. The cabin felt like a trap now, the walls closing in, suffocating her. The phone buzzed again, another message from Sarah. I'm here, let me in. Rachel stared at the screen, her blood running cold. She looked towards the door, but something told her not to open it. The fire sputtered out completely, leaving her in darkness. The knocking resumed, louder, more insistent. But this time, it wasn't coming from the door, it was coming from inside the cabin, from the walls, the ceiling, the floorboards. The sound surrounded her, a rhythmic pounding that matched the beating of her heart. She was trapped. In a moment of sheer terror, Rachel dropped the fire poker and ran towards the back door. She had to get out, had to escape this nightmare. But as she reached the door, she froze. The door wasn't there. The walls had shifted, the layout of the cabin warping, twisting into something unrecognizable. She turned around, and the figure from the forest was inside. Standing in the center of the room, it was closer now, its features still obscured, but the malice radiating from it was palpable. Rachel stumbled backward, her legs giving out beneath her. The knocking grew louder, the walls vibrating with each strike. The figure moved closer, its presence overwhelming. As it reached out to her, Rachel screamed, the sound tearing through the cabin. And then, everything went silent. The next morning, Sarah arrived at the cabin confused by the messages she had received from Rachel throughout the night. The door was ajar, and inside, she found Rachel's belongings scattered across the floor. But there was no sign of Rachel. The fire was out, the cabin cold and empty, 
save for one thing, a single message left on Rachel's phone, sent at exactly midnight. It's watching. As Sarah looked around, a chill ran down her spine. She felt it too now, the weight of unseen eyes on her. The figure was gone, but the cabin was not empty. It was never empty. 